Well, Ola, great to see you again. Thanks for joining our next Wave speaker series. And this is a series that we found a way to address pandemic difficulties we have being able to see each other over the big events and others that we used to do for CEO discussion. So this is one way we are closing the gap by meeting and discussing and then sharing through media. Thank you for having me. Great to see you again. Congratulations on your outstanding quarter. I'm sure managing the uh, rebound from a year ago has been difficult and challenging, the time where you're still locked down. So I'd like to hear your perspective of uh, what have happened the last one year and how did you manage this difficult time for the audience that want to know how does a global company like Daimler manage a situation like this, which is a crisis that happens maybe once every 100 years? If we look back to that time when it really started, uh, let's say, for us in February in China and then in March it kind of came to Europe and also the United States and the other markets, at that time we really didn't know what we were looking at. Yeah, so naturally you, you switch into another mode as the company, you could almost call it crisis management mode. Uh, so what has carried us through these past 12, 15 months and how could we create this result in, in the first quarter? One thing was uh, next to the first priority, how do we protect our people? How do we change our processes and, ma and make sure that we fight the pandemic? Uh, the next uh, priority to that is, of course, how do we protect the company and protect the cash flow in particular? Right. Uh, so going into strict cash management helped us in 2020. So cash management, focus on the things that count, uh, but at the same time, don't stop the important product projects like this car, for instance, or the S-Class that we launched uh, in the fall of 2020. So all of those important product launches, none of those slipped. Uh, and that gives us a portfolio of products that really hit the spot uh, and, and carried us through the fall and into the first quarter. So an extremely strong product portfolio, uh, driving uh, demand, obviously, but also uh, in a strong mix from a pure financial contribution point of view. And if you put those two things together, markets are rebounding, strong product portfolio, good mix. Uh, so more of the vehicles on, on, on the upper side of our portfolio, but combined with the cost discipline that we have kept uh, and, and will try to keep uh, going forward, uh, led to, to a very strong financial result in, uh, in Q1. And of course, uh, we're now eager to keep this momentum going. Right. It's amazing how I'm sure during the lockdown, I remember um, early last year in April, May, your plant was basically shut down and all the supply chain had to be readjusted and as well as dealing with uncertainty of not knowing when it's going to be opened it up. And of course, Harman and Daimler had a joint project that is to deliver the latest S uh, projects that are S-class projects that are really incredibly uh, better than prior experience. So this whole uh, Mercedes-Benz, you know, the UX experience is something that I know was very important to you because it's such a very important part of your product strategy and platform strategy. And uh, I don't think we have lost any uh, beast in that during the pandemic, despite the, the environmental difficulties we have. So maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, how that went with your introduction of S, and then of course, the follow on with our EQS product. So maybe an interesting segue. If we start with the supplier relationships that we have, and I think this has sometimes been, maybe even been a little bit misrepresented in the press. As you said, we closed our factories for the better part of April <laughs> into May. Uh, we didn't do it because we had disruption in the supply chain. So at that stage, in this early stage of a pandemic, the ultimate stress test for a global supply network uh, I would like to, to applaud the work of our suppliers and also uh, uh, the partnership that we had with Harman and, and with Samsung. You kept us going. The reason why we shut down was because due to the lockdowns, the market was gone on the one hand. And on the other hand, together with health authorities, we quickly realized in that first wave, got to break the tip of the wave. 
So it was more those reasons that led us to, uh, shut down. And even in engineering, where we could not you know, all sit together as we usually do when we work on a technically sophisticated project, even going into digital mode in engineering together with our suppliers worked. But specifically for the launch of the S-Class uh, that we did in September of last year, yes, the second generation MBUX uh, uh, is one of the key features of the car. Uh, we, have, we have taken the whole electric, electronic architecture into a new generation. Uh, almost all of it has over-the-air download capability. Uh, and the centerpiece is, is, is of course, the, the, the interface through infotainment. Uh, and to now add so many features, uh, take voice to the next level, all of this biometric recognition, you, you step into the car and basically it says, hello, Ola, and it recognized me through the camera that is watching the driver, or I have a fingerprint recognition if I, if I prefer that. All of these features uh, under the banner of human-centric innovation, not just technology for the sake of technology, but thinking through what does, you put the human at the center of things, what, what, what really makes the driving experience better or safer, uh, more relaxing, uh, what, what could it be? All of those things have come together in, um, in the new S-Class. And the feedback that we have gotten from customers is absolutely phenomenal. So it, we have taken it to the next level and marry it to the hyperscreen in this car. It really feels like, I don't know, Star Trek, you're, you're moving into the future. Well, you know, uh, I'm, I, I know the, the work that went in to get there. And uh, it's not easy. And often it's a lot of a commitment and sacrifice and pressure to build it, because I've seen making of it, and I'm happy to see that it's made it to be a very good, good, successful product. And then now you have a Tesla Challenger that are coming out, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a long time that I've been waiting for German companies' response in terms of the electrification, uh, in terms of really the smartphone capabilities that are really adapted in the uh, automotive era. That, that are happening in many ways with, of course, more safety and more features and, of course, much bigger engine that you have to move. I would love to hear about the new uh, EQS and uh, what is your perspective and what, how do you see it stacking up with uh, someone like Tesla and other startups that are coming out there? EQS is a project that is now, let's say, four or five years in the making. It was back in 2016 when we made the decision that uh, as we usher in this era of transformation and ultimately all of our vehicles will be zero emission. It's, it's, it's a transformational period. Much of that transformation will happen in, in, in this decade, in my belief. And we said uh, in our home turf at that upper end of the market, the S-Class segment, uh, which we have dominated for so many years, so many decades, uh, we really felt uh, here we need to almost start with a white sheet of paper. And that's why the decision was made to create an architecture for luxury large vehicles, fully dedicated electric only architecture, and then make the EQS the feature car, flagship car, the sibling to the S-Class, uh, the first one to demonstrate what, what we can technically do and also aesthetically and so on. Uh, so may, many people ask me, uh, so when you define, when you wrote down the scope of work for this car, what, you know, were you looking at the startups or uh, were you looking at what other OEMs are doing? Uh, actually, actually, the answer to the question is no. Uh, the first car we looked at is the sibling car, the S-Class. It's got to measure up with the S-Class. And it happens to be a fully electric car. Uh, when you're going to electrification from traditional engine, you can be out of box. And it sounds like that's really what's, what the opportunity here is. So I want to talk a little bit about the out of box experience, right? Because our combustion engine has been around 100 years. And uh, companies have built their business around that technology. Uh, and going forward, clearly electrification is going to become major, major force behind the changes. And tell me about what is your electrification strategy, not just in the car perspective, but infrastructure perspective, as well as the uh, designing the future car perspective. 
uh, it is a, a big challenge because problem is the startup company can just start from the scratch and clearly just new architecture they can optimize around new approach. But for you, you also have traditional ongoing business and factories that you have to deal with. So it's a bigger challenge, what I call innovative dilemma. So I'd like to hear your view of how you are trying to manage this change that are happening, disruption that are happening, and trying to make changes to enable to become the successful force behind the uh, new uh, category of company products. Uh, it starts with, I would say, a mindset decision that you have to make. And I think that's also when you discuss the innovator's dilemma is, are you more attached to your past or your current success, or are you more looking at what's going to happen in the future? And uh, um, there is a saying from a, a famous business industrialist that I've kind of used that as a motto in this context. Uh, he used to say many years ago, and this was a very traditional Swedish industrial family, he said, uh, to move from what is to what is about to come is the only tradition worth keeping. Mm -hmm. Which I think says it all. So you got to make a mindset switch first. And with our statement ambition 2039, we said then in 2019, in 20 years time, 10 years ahead of the Paris Climate Agreement, we're going to turn Mercedes into a CO2 neutral company. So you start with that, just put a stake in the ground, this is where we're going, there are no ifs or buts, and from that point forward, it's all about implementation. But as you said, it's a multi-dimensional problem if you are an incumbent OEM. Uh, and that's why you can't make it too simple and say, let's just do a bunch of electric cars. It would be jumping not far enough. So it's about the supply chain, it's about your own operations and production, it's obviously about the product, but it's also about the product in use. So when we talk about Ambition 2039, we said all of these four dimensions have to go CO2 neutral, a 360 degree approach. And then of course there's a social aspect to it as well. Many people work in, uh, in traditional powertrain factories, combustion based. Uh, the industrial footprint of an electrified world is completely different to the industrial footprint that we have been used to. And frankly speaking, and this is something we have to be open about, uh, in that dimension, there are going to be less jobs. There will be other areas, software engineering and, and, and other technical areas, innovative areas, where we're adding a lot of high qualified jobs. But we have a social transformation to do there as well. If I now look at the journey, uh, if you have made the mental decision and then you turn it into your strategy, well, as a business uh, a person, what do you do? You start allocating capital to the new. And there are infrastructure questions that have to be solved. There are energy source questions that have to be solved. Naturally, the energy needs to come from uh, renewable sources. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of, of the whole, whole exercise. Uh, but for us as a company, I think it is this decade that we need to use to do most of the transformation. That's good to hear. Yeah, to yeah. put ourselves in a position uh, that when we break into the 30s, it's almost, like, it's almost like everything is ready to go. And then we'll see market adoption and how, how, how things uh, uh, turn out around the world. Uh, what we're also actively seeking is uh, you, can't, you can't do this alone. This is a, a team effort and it's industry plus politics, governments working together. So we're in an active dialogue, not just here in our, let's say, home country, Germany, on talking about master plan for infrastructure. This is things happening in all the major uh, economic regions uh, and countries. But we're now actively pushing. Yeah. So how can we, how can we get policy making to support this new industrial or <coughs> new technological strategy? Uh, uh, will not be an easy journey. Uh, I have a lot of respect for what, what, what the work that we have ahead of us. Uh, but if you think about it, it's a promise of a better future, isn't right. it? I mean, this is a major shift from what had been to where we need to go. And obviously cannot do it alone. And obviously requires the industrial, industrial mobilization that are from government regulation all the way to supply chain 
and the partners. And I noticed also you have recently announced your um, joint venture effort with uh, Volvo uh, regarding the uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cells. And I thought that was very interesting uh, as you're looking at the uh, energy source. Clearly, there is a green energy source and there is also not very green energy source. And I think figuring out the right source of energy is probably ongoing challenge that we have to deal with. Uh, maybe you can talk some more about why you uh, decide to support this kind of project and your, what is your personal view about hydrogen going forward? So in this particular case, uh, we're looking at it from two perspectives. One is a very practical engineering problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you make a 40 ton truck go a thousand kilometers a day fully loaded? We felt that there is a crossover in, in, in just technology in the vehicle where the fuel cell as a technological solution for a vehicle that needs a lot of energy kind of, at least for now, beats the, the, the battery electric solution. And with the energy density of a fuel cell and uh, either gaseous or liquid hydrogen, now this solution really becomes interesting. Yeah, and also from a variable cost uh, uh, point of view, if you then scale it, we could actually see, well, actually this could beat, uh, from a pure business uh, perspective, uh, the battery electric long haul truck. For shorter distances, uh, trucking to short to medium distances, we have battery electric trucks. And we have them in the market already today, and we're launching a couple of more products this year. So this is not like a, like a, a religious battle about is it, is it A or B. In our case, we have both technological horses in the race. So we were happy that the fuel cell technology is something that we were working on for a long, long time. I mean, at Daimler, we started research on this almost like 30 years ago. So we have a lot of intellectual property. Uh, our, our perhaps biggest competitor, Volvo, <laughs> in this case, they see that end of the market in a similar way. And we made the pragmatic decision with them to say, if we are going to get this um, technology scaled, mm -hmm. uh, it's better if two players yes. uh, move together, because maybe you create then the critical mass. That puts us in that other perspective that you say, great idea, but what if I don't have any green hydrogen? What am I going to do? Uh, our thinking on this is, in a world, eventually, decades from now, where fossil is either gone or significantly reduced, we have to have an alternative energy carrier. And it will not be electricity only, because then you would have to, have to store so much electricity, it's almost inconceivable that that can be done. And hydrogen is an alternative energy carrier. So if society at large, economies, business, industries at large say, we got to have a hydrogen economy at the same time, uh, then it makes so much sense that where this industry uh, uh, gets created, that we then use the hydrogen for the right use cases. If you then have a hydrogen economy complementary to the electricity economy, it's almost like you're back to the old way of doing things. Yes, it's a different energy carrier, it's not diesel anymore, but you can fill up the truck in seven, eight, nine, ten minutes, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So scaling the infrastructure, once you have made that decision, could perhaps be even easier. And this is the discussion also that we're having politically, where also governments are starting to think, aha, we need both and we are going to uh, work on both technologies. Yeah. This is why the new approach requires intimate collaboration between policymakers, industry, and players. And I'm so glad to see that you are willing to work with other players, including your competition, to enable some of the new approach to prove and then to see, be able to move the dime, which is what's required here. And I agree with you. I think that um, um, electric cars are great, but it does require a lot of batteries. And those batteries are not always very clean energy, so we have to figure out how to recycle them. And so this, and, uh, this challenge will continue as we have more electric cars on the road. 
No question. Recycling will be very important. Uh, not just recycling, actually also Second Life. Uh, we have a, a, a small, let's call it, startup company inside Daimler, uh, which already today uh, is, uh, has done a few installations where we have taken old car batteries, stacked them, <laughs> and then you can use them for industrial use. So they can become a, a storage solution for industrial use. But not all of the car batteries, one day when they come back, are going to be able to do that. So we need a we need a, a, a recycling chain or circular economy system that takes the precious raw materials out of the battery cells again at the end of life and puts them back into the chain. And also for economic reasons, one of the most expensive pieces of the battery is obviously the raw materials that go into it. So you want to extract those uh, back out again. Uh, there we're working on, um, on some own facilities, but we're also working with partners, experts in this recycling field. And I am I'm relatively optimistic that we will find recycling methods where we, so to speak, can tear the battery cell apart again, get, get out the, the, the precious uh, raw materials, and then get them back into to the beginning of the, of the system. Cobalt, magnet. Yeah. and others that Nickel. are really hard to yeah. find. Those are yeah. earth materials. Yes. That's really good to hear that. Um, let's talk about autonomous driving, something that are also critical. It requires massive investment, and I know Daimler has been working on this for a long time. I also know that you have uh, projects, partnership with Waymo and others on your trucking and others. So what is your view of autonomous driving? Clearly at a different level of uh, assistant, uh, but the question of um, better safety with assistant features makes sense. I guess the question is really level three and up in terms of when the robot or when the car takes over the driver. It's that equation, and I'm very curious about what's your thoughts on this. Yeah, I know we have had many conversations <laughs> yeah. over the years. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I think back when we met, uh, maybe at the CES five years ago oh or my so, God. Yes. Uh, uh, probably both of us thought it's just around the corner and we just oh, have to well, fix it. Well, you know, it. when guy like Elon Musk <laughs> promises <laughs> there will be autonomous cars in 2019, remember that? I, I, I remember <laughs> that. Um, uh, perhaps we've gotten a little bit more realistic, but not mm -hmm. less enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so how are we looking at this now from a, from a Daimler point of view? I would like to divide it into shall we call it three different use cases or customer groups. One is the one that comes most natural to us. You have individual mobility, in our case, in style, luxury, individual mobility. Uh, we are uh, the inventor of the original driving assistant systems, and we're now on the verge of taking those very sophisticated driving assistants to fully autonomous functions in some, uh, in some, in some circumstances. And in fact, for the S-Class and for this EQS, we are going to attempt uh, in the second half of this year, start, starting here in Germany, where, where also law has been written, a really detailed law has been written, what, what, you know, what is allowed and what is not allowed. And safety is paramount here. Make, make no mistake about that. Especially with the three-pointed star, safety has to be your, your, first, your first priority. But we want to launch uh, a first production scale level three system on the highway up to what is now allowed in Germany, 60 kilometers an hour. So in a heavy traffic situation, maybe you're sitting in a traffic jam. Uh, I tested the latest version of that last week. When I drove this level three system now, I was thinking to myself, it is, it is an unbelievable feeling letting go. I mean, really letting go and not being nervous where you can do other things at level three, you're not allowed to sleep because there, it, there are situations where a handover needs to be able to happen. So for that private use case, we're gonna continue investing in this. So this year, maybe that breakthrough, the moon landing, a level three, uh, we're gonna make the level two systems much more performing and sophisticated. So even if you are in control, the car will be able to do much more uh, and that will continue. That's our main road for Mercedes. If I jump to the trucking side of things before I come to the thing that many people think about, the robot taxi, I'll leave that for a second. On the trucking thing, it's about economics. Right. 
the biggest cost in dollars or cents per mile for trucking is the cost of the driver. It's not, it's not the depreciation of the truck, it's not even the fuel, it's the cost of the driver. If you in a highway trucking situation could take the driver out of the equation and have the robot drive the truck, for instance in the United States, very long distances, very good roads, very straight, southwest at least, good weather, that would be a complete game changer. So we are working on the one hand in a uh, partnership with Waymo on this. Waymo has selected for their computer driver uh, program Freightliner, which is the leading truck company in the US that is a subsidiary of Daimler. They said, who, who, who are the best people technologically? Freightliner. And we have teamed up with them. So their computer driver, when it becomes mature, is then married to a Freightliner truck. We have our own effort going at the same time, so almost like we're in, in co competi competition with each other, but also cooperation at the same time. We bought a startup uh, company in Virginia some years ago called Torque, a uh, great technical team that we're working on this for more than 10 years, uh, and also has, have products in some uh, specialty niches already in the market. Uh, so I think that eventually we will get there that we will have to, for hub to hub on the highway, uh, trucking with computer drivers. Uh, it will make transport much more cost efficient and I believe also safer. And then comes the last piece, the thing that we were all thinking about first. Let's make a fully autonomous vehicle, we'll turn it into a mobility service and we have like a ride hailing service but with instead of drivers, computers. I think that's going to happen too but it's the most sophisticated problem to solve. Uh, we're working on that and it's also one that if you want to scale it around the world, uh, you want to do Seoul, you want to do San Francisco, you want to do, I don't know, Berlin and so on, it is not an insignificant uh, uh, scaling task <laughs> to get that going. That's where we said, do we need to be a taxi company first? Even though I know a lot of taxi drivers love Mercedes and I don't uh, uh, want to lose them as customers and we said no. Uh, we're a luxury tech company, primarily for individual mobility on the car side. Let's start there, and then we'll see what happens eventually with the robot taxi one day. Very interesting. So, um, technology adoption is happening, but full autonomous will take time. Part of that is technology, part of that is regulation, and part of that is probably a lot to do with adoption of the uh, combination of those things have to come together. I want to change the subject a little bit uh, about you. And the, uh, I don't know that the audience knows a lot about your background, but I know you've been working at Daimler over 25 years. And you became the first non-German CEO for a major German auto company. So as you became the CEO of the company, uh, you are in the midst of also major disruptive forces that are happening around uh, automobile industry, German industry in particular. So I would like to hear your view of your opportunities and challenges that you have to deal with in this change. First of all, I've, I've had uh, up until now such an exciting and tremendous journey throughout this company. Mm -hmm. So when I started here back in 1993, uh, I, was I was attracted by the three-pointed star. I mean, the, that Mercedes brand and the technical excellence, the original inventor of the automobile and so on. For me as a Swede, uh, growing up in, in Sweden, thinking about uh, technology, business to be in, the brand stood for me uh, for something above others. And I was really happy that when I could join the company. Uh, and if I see what has happened in these decades here, being part of the journey, for much of the time, we have perfected, let's call it perfected the original invention. Make it better and better and better and better and better. Now comes the point where we have to reinvent the original invention. And of course, CO2, the climate change challenge and so on, is, is one of the, the main driver, but not the only one. It is the computing power that is now available to us software algorithms, artificial intelligence, and so on. So it's like so many things are coming together at the same time. And now we have the ingredients. It's like the engineers have the ingredients. We can reinvent the invention. 
That is what happening, what's happening now. That puts an enormous stress on the system that we talked about before. Uh, so maybe it's the most challenging of times, but it's also the most exciting of times for a technology company, for an innovation company. Isn't that, isn't that the ultimate task that you want? Well, I to think... To kind of, kind of get out of the cage and, and, and just be able to go in, in new directions. Yeah. Uh, so I like to look at this in, an, in optimistic terms. Right. Yes, uh, uh, we have a roller coaster ahead of us, uh, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, that, that journey and kind of the destination of the journey is a very exciting destination. Yeah, I think in a time of disruptive, you need a strong, determined, non-afraid leadership. And I guess the, that excitement will help you to give courage, to make bold decisions. And I know you have done that already since you've been CEO, uh, because as you been, get to work together for many years now, and I get to see the changes they are making, which is bold. And that's hard to do in a successful company uh, that has been around for a long time, because I can relate to that at Samsung. Uh, as you are more successful, these bold changes are much harder to do than incremental changes and just making it better. So it can only happen from the top. It can only happen when the leaders are believing it's a, it's a crisis, it's time for change. And I believe that bold and excitement is probably what's required um, to, be a, uh, to have the courage to make the moves. So one last question around the uh, lessons you learned the pandemic that, that you can share with other CEOs or wannabe CEOs out there, whether it's a startups or large corporations. What are some of the things you learned during the pandemic that are key lessons that you think you can be able to practice going forward? For us, is the pandemic was not an excuse to stop the transformation. Mm -hmm. So it has not been something where you say, okay, we have now a crisis here, let's, let's hit the pause button, deal with the crisis, and then we get back to business again afterwards. Mm -hmm. No, if anything, it's probably been more of a catalyst. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one lesson. Another lesson is, and perhaps we should have known it beforehand, we can operate this company at the lower cost level without sacrificing our innovation speed or power. So I realized that uh, the travel cost, which is one you know, obvious example, that is virtually zero now. It's not going to be zero once we get out of the pandemic, but we cannot let it drift back to what it was before. So the digital tools that were all available to us that we have now used because we had no other choice for the last 12 months, we'll continue to use those, although I'm very, very, very eager <laughs> to get back together with people again. Uh, and, and of course, we have to do that. We cannot be in this, uh, you know, living in a digital cave for the rest of our lives. I think uh, socially that wouldn't work, no. uh, nor do I believe that is, is the best bet for innovation. So we, we got to get the teams back together. It's, it's no doubt in my mind. But we can take some of those elements that we have uh, uh, had to use now in the last 12, 15 months and see if we can keep the best part of them, parts of them. Keep the cost discipline. And, and maybe, maybe the third one in terms of working, we already had a policy uh, at Daimler where you could, what we call mobile working. You don't have to, if you, if you don't need to, be in the office every day. You can work from other places, you can work from home, or you can work from other places. So that mobile working policy had been in place for years. Some people used that, but it was viewed upon culturally as something that maybe you were slightly skeptical about. It's only real work if you're actually in the office and people right. can see you. Right. Now we know that you can actually run a 300,000 person company in 150 countries, literally from your, from your own living room. It is possible, maybe not forever, but it is possible. So this mindset shift in terms of culture, that we need to have a more fluid way of looking at work, I think that's also something that we can keep. Uh, and, 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 and can maybe make the work environment uh, in, in total more, you know, more effective. Right, more yeah. humane actually. Yeah. Right? yeah. So 
Uh, somebody asked me, does that mean that uh, Monday and Friday we stay at home and we only go uh, <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday? I said, well, logistically, probably not a good idea uh, because the, uh, if you have a floating uh, desk policy, then uh, everybody show up. <laughs> you cannot have every passenger take the same bus. Right. <laughs> you, right, have right. Have, you have to divide yourself up. Yeah. Uh, so we have to be smart about it. Uh, but if that's the silver lining, there's not much positive to say about COVID for obvious reasons. Uh, but if, if there is a silver lining, it's been this uh, open our minds to maybe change some of our thinking. That's really great. I think Winston Churchill said that never waste a crisis. And I think that's what you're doing. You continue to push your transformation and uh, using the cloud and mobility as a way to improve the productivity and provide uh, flexibility to the workforce, which I think can be a win-win for both sides. But I really appreciate your time and sharing your thoughts and stories about the where the future is going. And uh, really good to see you again. Thank you, Young, for having me as always. It's a pleasure to see you. Great. Thank you. <laughs>